happy Maranatha. Amen. <laughs> Isn't that what we learned this last New Year's Eve? That we know that we are now getting closer to the return of Christ, and this could be the year that he returns for his church. Amen. Amen. It's a very special Sunday, the first Sunday of the year, uh, specifically for myself and uh, my wife. Today is our anniversary, so we're just so grateful. Yes. <laughs> I told her if we get married the second day of the year, I'll never forget our anniversary. Now she asked me, how, how long have we been married for now? I said, I think it's just been a week. I'm still so in love with you. <laughs> But we want to pray for those that are sick. I know that there is flus going around, viruses that are going around, and uh, maybe you're at home right now watching online. We want to tell you that we love you, we're praying for you, and we pray that you would recover soon and then join us. Can we pray for them? Lord, Heavenly Father, we do come and we pause again. Lord, we know that you are a sovereign, you're in control of all things, Lord that you are the God who is in charge of every season. And Lord, and in this season, Lord, as many have become ill, Lord, that you would heal, that you would restore. We trust you, that you are Jehovah, our healer. That you can hear, heal, Lord. That you can restore. So we pray this all, Lord, in your name, in Jesus' name, and together we said, amen. Would you open your Bible with me? To the book of Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. Last week we looked at the first part of the prayer of Paul here. As he ends this first section of Ephesians with a prayer for the believers. And we've titled today's message, God is Able. Can you say that out loud? God is Able. How many of you believe it today that he is able? Amen. God is able. And as we saw the first portion of his prayer for the believers, after he spent three chapters describing the riches that they have in the grace of God, their inheritance, their possessions in Christ Jesus, the redemption, their adoption in Christ, now he ends this section before he talks about their walk, in chapter 4, he ends it with a prayer. And in chapter 3, he said, we have full access to the presence of God through Christ Jesus. In the beginning of the prayer, he says, we have full power through strength in the inner man. But then today, we're going to see that he speaks of full expectancy. Full expectancy. He's saying, I'm praying for you because you have the truth now. You know the truth. Now that there will be a depth in the life of the believers. A depth in the life of the believers. And he prays for four different things. If you were with us last week, he prays, number one, that they would be strengthened with power in the inner man. Strengthened with power in the inner man. That God would empower them by his spirit. He also prays, number two, that, they, that Christ would dwell in their hearts. That God would take over, Christ would take over their hearts that he would have it all, that he would be a permanent residence, that he would make his home their hearts. Number three, he prays that they would be rooted and grounded in love, that they would grow up in love, that they would mature in love, that there would be some depth in their lives. But also he prays that they would know the love of Christ. Now notice, he doesn't say that they would feel the love of Christ only, but that they would know the love of Christ because knowing the love of Christ transforms your life. It's a transforming love. And the result of all of that is to be filled with the fullness of God. To be filled with the fullness of God. Verse 19 says this of Ephesians chapter 3. To know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. 
To him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Can we read verse 20 and 21 together out loud? It says this. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever Amen. Now, what is the result of this prayer? Here he explains it to us that we would be filled with the fullness of God. What does that mean? That we would grow up in spiritual maturity. And the word filling in verse 19, as we use that as an introduction for today's text, has to do with control, filling. Where the Spirit of God, where the fullness of God controls now your heart, the desires of your heart, the desires of your mind, your soul to carry out his will. That you would be filled with the fullness of God. It's not a little bit of God and a little bit of me. (laughs) No, that you would be filled to the top now, filled in all with all of God. God desires to have it all. So he's saying here, well, I pray that as a result of this request, you would be filled with the fullness of God. You would be controlled and therefore grow up in spiritual maturity. Now, when the verse is 16 or verse 19 that we went over, when these conditions are met, when this prayer is answered, then God's power is working through us far beyond our understanding. When these things are met, when God answers this prayer, then the power of God is working in us far beyond what we can understand. And that's what Paul is praying. As he concludes his prayer here, he's praying with faith, and then he's looking forward to the answer of that prayer with great expectation. Now notice, in prayer here, he has the confidence that God is able to do what he prayed for, that God is able to do it. Not only is he reminding us today, the very first Sunday of 2020, that there is power in prayer, but that God answers prayer. How many of you believe that today? God answers prayers. And that's exactly what he's saying. So maybe today as we're entering a new year, we're entering also new steps of faith. As we're entering this new year, we're entering tests that we will face, trials that we have to endure, maybe fearful of what this next season will bring. Well, I want you to know this as we look to Ephesians 3, that we should always measure our problems, our trials, our difficulties, not by our capacity to be able to handle them, but by his ability. Because God is able. We ought to never look at it in our own strength. We ought to never look at those trials, those tests, in our own ability, our own capacity, but his power, his ability. You see, the difficulties, the trials should be measured always by the capacity of the agent that is doing the work. Who is the agent doing the work? God is the agent. God is at work. And if God is at work, God is also able. He's always able. So he goes from enlightenment, what has God done for you, to empowerment that you would be filled with the Spirit, now to enablement. And we'll look at four different things here in just two verses as to how he closes this prayer. Number one, we see that he's looking forward with faith. This year, as we begin this race of 2020, can we look forward with faith on everything that God is able to do? Because this is exactly what he's doing. Number one, would you write this down? Looking forward with faith. This is what Paul is doing. In fact, he says, now to him who is able to do. This is where he looks forward with faith. Now to him. Yes, God is able, but you notice that he's focusing his attention. He's focusing his worship. And he's focusing his faith on him. His eyes are on the Lord. He says, now to him. Circle that in your Bible, now to him. As you begin this year, that your eyes would be on him, not on what man can do, but what God can do. Now to him, his faith is there. 
His worship is there. His attention is there. His eyes are on the Lord. Now to him who is able to do. (laughs) This is amazing here. Able to do. What does this speak about? This speaks of God's power. In fact, what he's saying, that to him who has the ability to make this possible. To him who can answer this prayer that Paul has just prayed for the church. In fact, he has faith, as he says, now to him who is able, he has faith that God has the power to accomplish this request. He has faith that with God's power, nothing is impossible. I don't care what the doctor said, how far down you are in your marriage, how sick your child may be, with God, nothing is impossible. God is able. And that's exactly what he's saying. I had a, uh, just between services right now, a couple came up to me who, who had a, the opportunity to just to pray for the wife just two, three weeks ago. She said, we're, we're about to get a divorce. Would you just pray for us? We're in the last now process of this divorce. And today she comes with a smile the first Sunday of the year. I want to introduce you to my husband. We stopped the divorce. God is able. God is able. So today we have to pray this year, Lord, deal with my unbelief. Lord, would you deal with my unbelief so that I can have faith that moves mountains? What happened when those disciples could not rebuke or cast out that demon from that young boy? That they came to Jesus after and they said, Jesus, what happened? Why could we not do it? In Matthew 17, verse 20, it says, So Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief. For surely I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, just if you have just a little bit of faith, (laughs) you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. We have to say, Lord, would you deal with my unbelief so that I really trust you, that I truly trust you this next year and believe that God is able. Now to him who is able to do. Not only that, but his confidence is in the Lord. Now it's important for us to know that God is able because there are going to be times of chaos. And during those times of chaos, during those times of testing, during those times of difficulty, it's important that we remember that God is in control, that he is always on time and he's never late. And the challenge may be great, but so is God who's in charge. We have to stop telling our problems and stop telling God how big our problem is. In fact, we always go and tell God, look, God, how big this problem is. Instead of going to that problem and saying, look how big my God is. With God, nothing is impossible and nothing is able to stop his power. Nothing is able to stop his power. So we see here, as he's looking forward with faith, that he's approaching the Lord in this prayer. He's closing even the prayer as well with confidence in the Lord. Not only faith in the Lord, but also confidence in the Lord. I'm gonna ask you this morning, where is your confidence this year? Is it truly on the Lord or is it on a man? Because when our confidence is on circumstances, when our confidence is on our own timing, when our confidence is on a person, we're gonna become easily discouraged. And the circumstances will discourage us. But know this, Philippians 1.6, the God who is able, the Bible tells us this, being confident in this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. That God never begins something that he is not able or does not intend to finish. God is able. In fact, his word tells us, be confident in this very thing that he who began that work in your life is going to complete that work. In Romans 16, 25, Paul tells the church of Rome, now to him who is able or who has the power, he has the power, the power is in him. Now to him who is able to establish you, you know what he's able to do? He's able to make you strong. Even through every season to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. God is able to establish you. So our faith should be on him who is able to do. Our confidence should be on him who 
begins and also finishes. Who's the Alpha and who's the Omega? That we would look forward this year to everything that God has for us in faith. But number two also, that we would be trusting in God's promises. Would you write that down? That we would be trusting in God's promises. As we wait, as we look forward, you know what we also are doing? We're trusting in God's promises. Now this is where, in verse 20, he describes the power of God that is able to do. Notice as he describes the power of God. Now to him who is able to do, and here it is, the promise, exceedingly and abundantly above all that we ask or think. That is him trusting in God's promises. He's describing the omnipotence of God. What does that mean, that God is omnipotent? It means that he is all powerful. Write that down today. God is all powerful. And because he is omnipotent, that means that we can now trust in his promises that he is able to do anything. All powerful. He can do anything. He has unlimited power now. Nothing can limit the power of God. Nothing can stand away of the power of God. Nothing can stop God's plan. In fact, how does he describe the omnipotence of God? He uses these three different elements to the power of God. First he says, and he uses the word exceedingly. <laughs> exceedingly. You know, this is the Greek word, huper. You know what this means, this Greek word? It means to throw over or beyond, almost as if you're throwing a ball over the wall. To throw over or beyond. God has the power, and he is able to do over and beyond what you can ask or think. Exceedingly now. And I love that word exceedingly because it comes from that, that, root, that root word exceed, that God not only wants to be able to meet your requests, but he wants to exceed them. He doesn't only want to meet your petitions. He wants to exceed them. So what does it mean? That he is able to do, he is omnipotent, he's all-powerful, over and beyond, and notice the next element of his power, abundantly. Abundantly. What does abundantly mean? He refers to above measure or with generosity. We're so grateful that the Lord is so generous with us. That not only is he able to go over and beyond, he's also very generous and above measure in his power and what he's able to do. Above measure, he's generous. Exceedingly and abundantly with generosity is his, his power able to do. But notice here the third element of God's power here, above all. <laughs> not only exceedingly, not only does he want to exceed now, your expectations or your prayers or your plans. Not only does he generous now in his power, but also he goes above all now. Above all means he goes higher, higher now. We oftentimes think, well, you know what? We will never be able to do that. Now we think, well, this sounds like a great idea, but we will never be able to do that. Yes, we may never be able to do that, but God is able. God is able. And he's saying he is able to do exceedingly above, beyond, above measure, generously, higher. Notice as he continues here, the, as he's here thinking about the promises of God, what we can ask or think of. This is him trusting in what God is able to do on his ability, not our capacity, his ability. More than what you can ask. Just think about that. God is able to do more than you can ask. More than you can ask and also more than you're afraid to ask. Have you ever been afraid to ask for something like, oh, Lord, I just don't want to ask you that. Well, he's able to do more than you can even ask, more than you're afraid to ask, and more than you can think, it says. More than you can imagine. God is not limited. God is not restricted through our circumstances. God is not limited. God is not restricted to one request. He's almighty. He's able to do exceedingly, abundantly. His power surpasses our highest aspirations, our earnest petitions. So what do we do as we're trusting in God's promises? What do we do? We have to be open 
to more of what God wants to do. This year, say, Lord, what else do you want to do in my life? Lord, what do you want to do next in your church? Lord, Lord, we're open to what you want to do because it's neither God's love nor God's power that's limited by our human imagination or capacity or thinking. So what do we do? We ask according to his greatness. That this would be the year that we trust in God's promises, and we ask, we seek, and we knock, looking forward with faith, that He is able to do. Now notice, He's able to do more than you're able to ask. He's able to do more than you're able to ask. He can take what you've asked and then enlarge it. God has a reputation of doing that. What does Pastor Jeff always say? He's large and he's in charge. God takes what we bring to him and then he can enlarge it. Oftentimes we think, well, God, you're hindering our plans. And he doesn't hinder your plans simply to cancel them. He hinders our plans because he wants to improve them. He wants to improve them. I was talking to a friend yesterday who needs to do repairs at the building of his church. And he's saying, well, you know, the blueprints are taking a while and you know, we need to do these repairs, and we're receiving hindrances. I just thought to tell him, well, maybe God doesn't simply want to repair the church. He wants to rebuild it. Oftentimes, we think, Lord, would you repair this? And the Lord's saying, I don't want to just repair it. I want to rebuild a whole new one. First Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, write this down. It says this, no eye has seen no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined. No one has seen, heard, or even imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. You have ne- no one has seen, no one has even heard or imagined what God's preparing for those who love him. It was William Carey, a well-known missionary that went to India. The Lord did great things through that man's life and faith. In fact, many came to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior there in India. But he said this when trusting in God's promises. He said this, attempt great things for God. Expect great things from God. Would we do do that even this year that we would attempt great things? Now, for God, expect great things from God. He then on went on and said, the future is as bright as as the promises of God. That is how the future looks for the believer that is trusting in the promises of God. That even in the darkest day, we believe in the light of the promises of God. In the light of the promises of God. And know this, because he is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all we can ask or think, notice this, we have not arrived yet. We haven't arrived yet. We've only arrived when we are with him in glory. There's still much more that God wants to do. There's so much more that he wants to accomplish through us. So much more that he is able to do, more than what we could ever think or imagine. I mean, the fact that I'm standing here right now is a proof of that verse. I would have never thought eight years ago when we started a small Bible study in my living room with only 25 chairs that the Lord one day would uproot that church that grew into a church and bring it over here to another church called Calvary Chapel of Downey. I remember as our lease was coming up in our building, we would drive by with a couple of leaders uh, down just and really dream and see a vision of just, man, that, that's an empty building. I think it was an empty Costco or something. And we'd say, Lord, you're going to move us into that building. And I was driving by, Lord, you're going to move us into that building one day. And one day I drove by and the Lord said, you're not thinking big enough. And I said, Lord, what what can possibly be bigger than this right now? I have a name for it. It's called Calvary Chapel of Downey. More than we can ask, think, or imagine. That's what he's able to do. But what is it? It's the spirit of God working. But notice this. It says ask. And God knows your request before you ask. So I want to tell you this. What are you asking for today? Are are you asking for peace in the middle of a storm right now? Are you asking for guidance in a decision that you need to make? 
Maybe you're asking for the salvation of a loved one that this year would be the year as you're trusting in God's promises that they would be saved. Victory over sin. You're asking for God's blessing on your marriage. God's blessing on the ministry. Well, no matter what we may ask or think, God is able to do it. And he knows our requests. He knows our need before we ask them. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 8, it says, Therefore, do not be like them. Do not be like unbelievers. For your Father knows the things that you need before you ask them. God knows the things that you need before you ask them. Not only does he know your needs before you ask, he also knows how much you need of it. God knows your needs. So he says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 31, again, Jesus speaking, therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? We begin the year oftentimes with worried. What's going to happen? What are we going to do? How are we going to face that situation? Trust in God's promises. He says, what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For after these things the Gentiles or the unbelievers seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. He is our Jehovah Jireh. The Lord is our provider. We don't have to worry. He knows the things that we need before we ask them. You know why we worry? Because we see the here and the now. So we get very worried. But God is able and he can see the there and the then. <laughs> what does he promise? How can we trust his promises? Here's some more promises for you today. That way you can leave today with some promises. Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the thoughts, the plans that I think toward you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you of future, and of hope. God is able to do it. And notice, not only is he able to do it, he has a plan. And it involves a future and a hope for your life. And you would say, well, that wasn't my plan. That's not what I intended. Well, God's plan, it's always better. And God's plan is always bigger. Isaiah 55, verse 8, what did the Lord speak through the prophet? For my thoughts, my plans are not your thoughts, nor my ways, your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. If God has a future and a hope for us, and he is able to do it, and his ways are higher than our ways, then we can trust in his promises, and we have a lot to look forward to. We think oftentimes with all the bad news that is surrounding us, what can we possibly have to look forward to? Well, we can look forward to the perfect will of God that one day we will be with him in glory. One day we will be with him in glory. So what is he doing? He's looking forward with faith. He's trusting in God's promises. But notice as he's trusting in God's promises, number three, he's relying on, on God's power. He's relying on God's power. How is a God able to do exceedingly and abundantly above what we can ask or think? Well, notice how that takes place according or through his mighty power. The word power is that word that we know of, dunamis or dynamite. It speaks of a dynamic life or dynamic power, an empowered life that is available to the believer. And he's saying this as he continues in verse 20, according to the power that works in us, relying on God's power. We're looking forward in faith. We're trusting in God's promises. We're relying in God's power this year. These are commitments as we pray, commit ourselves to pray, to read God's word, to be in fellowship, that we can see the Lord do exceedingly and abundantly. But notice here, according to the power, his dynamite power of the spirit that is at work or that works in us. That word work means to be active. The power of the spirit of God that is active or that is operating within us, inside of us. 
We are channels. We're vessels of this power. We're carriers of this power. He is working his power in us, within us. Now he's operating. And he wants to work in us first so then he can work through us. But we must recognize, even as we look at this verse, we need to recognize the need of the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. There is a need. And the need is the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. What does Paul say to the church of Colossians, Colossians chapter 1, verse 29? To this end, I labor, I'm laboring, I'm striving, I'm working towards, I'm exhausting myself according to his working, which works in me mightily. I'm allowing God's spirit to work in me powerfully. How does God's power work within us? How can we make ourselves available to the power of God working in us? By yielding, yielding and surrendering to the work of the Holy Spirit. This year, we need to say, Lord, we want this to be the year that you work in our lives through your power, through your spirit, as we rely on your power, and we make ourselves available. We surrender to your spirit, Lord. Whatever you want to do, Lord, you do it, and realize that the Holy Spirit does not always do the same things the same way. He does new things. God works in spontaneous ways. He works in new ways. He will do as much for us And through us, as we let him in us, he will do as much for us, and he will do as much through us, as we let him in us, as we let him in us. It was said of D.L. Moody, who the Lord used powerfully in Bible teaching, that he was selling shoes at his uncle's shop and He got to know Jesus as his Lord and Savior, and the Lord brought him into the ministry to teach God's word. And there he was teaching God's word in a group of uh, women that after one of the messages came up to him and said, you know what, pastor, we're praying for you that you would receive the power of the Holy Spirit. He's saying, what are you talking about? I've been teaching the word of God. People are getting saved, and and I can see the fruit of the hand of God that's working. He says, no, no, we're praying that the power of the Holy Spirit would fall in your life. And they prayed and they prayed. And one day, D.L. Moody was baptized by the Holy Spirit. And never again was he the same. But the Spirit of God flowed in that man's life, working in through that man's life. It flowed powerfully that many were saved through the ministry of D.L. Moody. You know what he realized? He said this, the world has yet to see what God will do with a man that is fully consecrated to him. By God's help, I aim to be that man. The world has yet to see what God will do with a man that is fully consecrated to him. By God's help, I aim to be that man. What would happen if we all said, we're going to be consecrated to the Lord, available to the Lord, separated to the Lord, so that the world can see what God can do through his people? What God wants to do through his people. See, the power of God not only gives us the capacity to do what he wants us to do, but also to be who God wants us to be. Are you inspired today by the Holy Spirit? Are you relying on the power of the Holy Spirit to step out, to do what the Lord has for you next? Are you relying on your own experience and knowledge and strength? In some Christians' life, know this, even maybe today, your own life, the spirit or the power is dormant. What does that mean, that it's dormant? It's available, but it's not being used. Is the power being used right now? And you know what happens? You become frustrated. You become disillusioned. You become afraid and anxious because you're trying to do it in your own power. The power is there available. We need to use it. We need to get plugged in to that source of power. He's able to do it. He is able to do it. If he will do it in your life, it's up to you. If you're surrendered to his will. Because when you're surrendered to his will, you know what happens? God's power is being pumped into your life and flowing through you that God's able to work in in your life. And he gets the glory. Where it's not the power of man, it's not the fingerprints of man. Notice what it is. It's the power of God. It's not a work of man. It's a work of God. 
Now, the power that is available to us, it does a few things for us. And I want to give you just four today that you would remember them, that you would live by them, that you would rely on his power to do these things. Number one, he's given us the power to witness. Acts chapter one, verse eight says, and you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, that you would witness, that you would evangelize, that you would bring someone to Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior this year. Not only that you would verbalize your faith, but also that you would demonstrate your faith. Not only do we go out witnessing, we are witnesses in our life. A lot of times, what you say is discounted because of what you do. God, through his spirit, has given us the power to witness, that we would share our faith, that we would point others to Jesus Christ. Power to witness. Number two, he's given us power that produces life. Would you remember that? Power that produces life. What did Jesus say when he's speaking to his disciples in John 15, verse 5? I'm the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, but in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. That is the power of God that we, and we are plugged into that power. It produces life, and that life produces fruit. Do you want to see fruit in your life this year? Then ask the Lord, Lord, would you fill me with that power that's able to do exceedingly and abundantly more than what I can ask, think, imagine? So that in me there is life, and because of life there is fruit. God gives us power that produces life. Number three, God gives us power for spiritual warfare. God gives us power for spiritual warfare. Did you know that most of our spiritual defeat results because of self Reliance, most of our spiritual defeat results or comes from us trusting in ourselves. And God is going to let us fail when we trust in ourselves. Because God doesn't want us to trust in ourselves. God wants us to trust in him. And sometimes it's unbelief. It can be unconfessed sin. It can be careless living. It can be worldliness in our action, or in our attitude. All of these things can serve as hindrances that rob us of this power now in spiritual warfare. It forfeits the power in our life. And that we would realize that in the flesh, we do not have power to fight spiritual warfare to victory. Never will we experience victory in spiritual warfare if we're fighting now warfare in the flesh. But no matter how difficult the warfare may seem, if we are walking in the power of the Spirit, God is able. God is able. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, the apostle said, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. <laughs> greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. We rely on the power of God. Have you ever been in a conversation or maybe in a difficult situation where you're, you're sensing opposition from the enemy and you give an answer, you walk away from that conversation, you said, I have no idea where that came from. I could have never thought about that. That is the power of the Holy Spirit. In fact, you have the power as you are in warfare to confront the enemy, to confront sin, to confront wrong was the minor prophet Micah that said this in Micah chapter 3, verse 8. Micah 3, verse 8. But truly, I'm full of power by the Spirit of the Lord. I'm full of power by the Spirit of the Lord and justice and might to declare to Jacob his transgressions and to Israel his sins. He has given us power in warfare to do things that we wouldn't do otherwise. That we wouldn't do otherwise. So he has given us power to witness, power that produces life, power for spiritual warfare. But notice, number four, power to do the work. Power to do the work. The work, the ministry, is the ministry that is only to be done in the Spirit, in the power of the Holy Spirit, and not in the power of human experience, of human knowledge, of our now gift, 
but it's to be done, the work and the power of the Holy Spirit. And notice when it comes to the ministry, the power of God, the Spirit is not a luxury, it's a necessity. It's a necessity. Do you remember where Zerubbabel was called to rebuild the temple? He did not know how he was going to finish the temple that was being rebuilt. Well, the Lord had a word for him through the prophet Zechariah, and it said this, this is the word to Zerubbabel. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. God has given us his spirit, the power to do the work. That the work of the ministry would be empowered through his spirit. It's God's ability that he's mentioned. It's God's power that yields God's glory. God's glory. What is it? God's ability, God's power, it yields forth God's glory. So what have we learned so far? That Paul here is looking forward with faith. That Paul is trusting in God's promises exceedingly and abundantly. That he's relying on God's power through the power that works in us. The power to do the work, the power to witness, the power that produces life. But all of this together, what does it do? It yields forth God's glory. So number four, he's giving God the glory. He's giving God the glory. This is what we call doxology. Doxology. It, it means praise or rendered praise, rendering glory and honor to the Lord. That, because he deserves it. Because he's worthy of it. Because he deserves all honor. Lord, we give it to you. We render it over to you. All glory. And this is what he says there in verse 21. To him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever, amen. God shares his power with us, not for our glory, but for his glory. And the work that he accomplishes, it's not for man's glory. It is for God's glory. It's not to build ourselves a name or recognition or reputation or attention. It's always to bring glory to God. And notice this, if we as believers are looking, if our motivation is to glorify God by building his church, if that is our motivation, if our motivation is truly to glorify God by building his church, it's not our church, it's not a man's church, the church doesn't belong to anyone, it belongs to him. And if that's our motivation, then he will share his power with us. Then he will share his power with us. God doesn't want you, he doesn't need you going around bragging about what you're doing for him. What did he say in the Sermon on the Mount? Don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. It's not about you. It's about the glory of God. And God is a jealous God. He doesn't share his glory with anyone. He doesn't share his glory with anyone. What is the ministry of the Holy Spirit? The ministry of the Holy Spirit is to point other people to Jesus. John 16, verse 14. Jesus spoke this. He will glorify me. He will point others to me. He will bring me glory for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. The ministry of the Spirit, when the Spirit is working, God is receiving all the glory. The attention is focused on Christ Jesus. That's when you truly know it's this work of the Spirit, is that God is getting all the glory. It's not, not, and it's not being touched by a, a person. It's that God is receiving all the glory. This is why he says, to him be the glory in the church. All praise and glory belong to God. And the glory that belongs to God should be from us personally, but notice it also how he describes this, in the church, corporately. Just circle that in your Bible, in the church. May he receive the glory in the church. May he receive the honor in the church. May he receive the attention in the church. It's his church. And he is worthy to receive glory in his church. He is the master builder who is building his church by Christ Jesus, his son. He is building his church. Romans eleven thirty six 36 tells us very clearly, for everything comes from him, exists by his power, and it's intended for his glory. Everything comes from him including his church. If everything comes from him and exists 
by his power, everything is existing by the power of God. Just think about this. It, God said there, let there be light. God said, let there be light. He created everything. And if everything exists by his power, then it's all intended for his glory. But notice this. God cannot, cannot be glorified in the church. This is very important that we realize. God cannot be glorified in the church until the church uses its spiritual resources. This is how dead churches are started. You want to know how? Because someone thinks that they can start a church off of metrics, off of personality, off of experience. That's not the church of the living God. The church of the living God is empowered by the Holy Spirit. This is why he's saying the Spirit of God ought to be flowing. And when the Spirit of God is flowing in his church, when it's not being hindered by anything, you know what's happening? God's receiving the glory. And if the power of God, if the Spirit of God can't flow in his church, if we stop, we hinder the Spirit of God flowing in his church, then he cannot receive the glory. We have to move out of the way and say, Lord, your Spirit, do what he wants to do. And say, Lord, we want to go the way of the Spirit so that you can receive the glory. Notice what he says, by Christ Jesus, as he continues. By Christ Jesus, would he receive the glory? Notice, to all or through all generations forever and ever, amen. This is amazing here because he's saying that God would receive the glory in his church by Christ Jesus through all generations, not through one generation. That he would not receive the power or the glory the last generation only, but in every generation would God continue to receive the glory. The generation previous, in the generation right now, and the generation to come until he comes, that he would continue to receive the glory without end. How many of us can praise God that God would continue to receive the glory in his church? Amen. <laughs> Through every generation. Notice what he's saying here. Paul is saying that he would receive the glory in every generation. He's able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond what we can think or imagine. You know what he's saying? The best is yet to come. And if we surrender to the Holy Spirit in our lives, if we allow the Holy Spirit to work through our lives the way he desires, notice what's going to happen. At the end of this year, we're going to be able to say, praise God, great things has, he has done. Praise God, great things he has done. Why? Because we've stepped into everything that he wants for our lives. He's able to do it. We need to surrender to his power. He's able to do it. We just need to surrender to the power of God after understanding every all his benefits, after understanding how rich we are in Christ Jesus, that he has redeemed us, that he has saved us, that we're set free from the bondage of sin that we would grow in a deep relationship with Jesus now as we've been adopted into his family, set apart for his use. And say, Lord, everything that you have for me, I want to be filled with the fullness of God. I heard a story about a man that was homeless, and for a year he was at a tram station begging for money. And for an entire year he's there asking for money. One day he pulls on the coat of a man and he says, sir, can you give me a dime? Sir, would you give me a dime? He pulls on the coat of that man after a year of begging there. And he, the man turns around and he, to his surprise, it was his father. It was his father. The man looks at him and he says, father, father, do you know me? Father, do you know me? Instantly, the father threw his arms around him and said, oh, my son. As he holds him, I found you, I found you. A dime, all I have is yours. All I have is yours. Do we understand how rich we are in Jesus? Do you understand how rich you are in Jesus? That all that he has, all that he is, is yours. What do we need to do? Surrender to his will. Yield ourselves. Surrender to his plan. That his power can work through us. Can we pray?